Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 20th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what happened to oil prices on Monday? And what does it mean for Alaska? Second, this coming election cycle will be about fiscal year 2022. What does that look like? And third, the impact COVID-19 is having on the federal fiscal situation is going to make the future much more difficult, starting with Social Security. And now, let's join Michael. The big news, of course, is that uh, the 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 oil prices just just cratered. I mean, just like weird, like wow, where did that come from? In the dirt, and uh, people are you know full on not panicking, but I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of craziness going on out there. What exactly is happening, and what does it mean for Alaska? I mean, does that mean that they're going to come and back a truck up to my yard and start? Uh, <laughs> if I if I, they give me thirty five dollars a barrel and they can stack as many as they want, or what? <laughs> I had a friend in Houston yesterday who offered his pool for yeah, he just, offered to drain the pool and fill it up with oil. Just dump it in there, <laughs> but, baby. Just dump it in. <laughs> I thought he could make a killing off that. So so let's let's get some basics down. There, there are there are two price bases out there in the world, major price bases. One is WTI, which is West Texas Intermediate, uh, and it's priced uh, based upon delivery of volumes into Cushing, Oklahoma, which is sort of the the hub, uh, the central hub for deliveries of oil uh, from West Texas uh, into the into the Mid Continent and Gulf Coast region because of the way pipelines run. Um, uh, in the Mid-Continent region. And WTI, what, when, when you hear people talk about WTI, they're talking about, they're, they're really talking about the oil price, they're, they're really talking about the price for oil um, uh, in the Mid-Continent and in the, in the Gulf Coast of the United States. The, the second price is Brent, and Brent is a field uh, in, the, in, in the North Sea, um, uh, in the UK sector of the North Sea, and it's been used as a pricing basis uh, for global uh, oil and for international oil uh, outside the United States. And uh, there are a lot of other pricing bases. I mean, there's Arab extra sweet and, and Arab heavy and all, all sorts of, it's probably 50 other pricing bases throughout the world. But the two main ones are WTI and Brent. Um, WTI really affects the price of, of in the in the U.S. Gulf Coast region and in the U.S. Midcontinent region and in the U.S. Atlantic Coast region. Brent affects the rest of the world, including the U.S. West Coast. There is very little connection in terms of oil deliveries between the Midcontinent part of the United States, the 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 West Texas part of the United States. Uh, and the West Coast. There really aren't any pipelines that run in that direction. There, re- there really aren't any trains that go in that direction, that carry oil that go in that direction. And there's very little connection between uh, the U.S. West Coast uh, and, uh, and, and, Gulf Co- and, the, and the rest of the U.S. Uh, oil market. Alaska goes into the U.S. West Coast. So sort of, sort of keep that in mind. All that was happening yesterday, what was happening yesterday was was with the WTI price, largely with the WTI price. It wasn't really yesterday. It wasn't really affecting 
uh, Brent all that much. And what was going on with that price was that uh, for for the the deliveries in May. I mean, the futures market is about when you deliver the oil. So when you're talking about May del- May futures price, that's for deliveries in May. June is for delivery in June. July is for delivery in July, and so forth. What was going on in the in the U.S. oil market was uh, we were getting close. Yesterday was the end on one trading uh, platform, and today is is the end on another trading platform. It was the it was the end of the May tr- trades for May. And what happened was you had a bunch of people who were long, that is, they, they held contracts uh, uh, for, uh, to buy oil, um, and, it, it, but you had no market. Uh, refineries are, are, are reduced rates. They're not buying oil right now. Storage is filling up. There's not really a whole lot of storage left. So you had people in the market who, who were long on contracts, who had contracts uh, to, to purchase oil, that they didn't want the oil. They didn't want to take delivery of the oil. A lot of what goes on in these futures markets is speculative trading. And, and when you get toward the end of a month, you close those out. Um, you, you, you transfer your contract or sell your contract to deliver oil uh, to somebody or to, to take oil to somebody else uh, who's, who owns a refinery or has storage or something like that. Uh, and you get out of the market. Because of the collapse in the market, because of the collapse in demand, because refinery rates are way down, because uh, storage is filling up, what was going on in the WTI market was you had a bunch of people who had contracts to take delivery of oil who didn't want it, really didn't want it. They had no place <laughs> to put it. They were speculators. Right. Um, and and they panicked. Uh, and basically – uh, uh, they kept they kept offering to sell the oil they had a contract for, or oil they had uh, uh, obligated to take delivery of. They kept offering lower and lower and lower prices to try to get rid of it. Um, and there were very very few purchasers uh, in the market uh, because they'd largely filled whatever needs they had. They'd largely used up whatever storage they had or whatever storage they wanted to use. And and these per- these sellers panicked and kept driving the price down and and when it got to zero they didn't stop they really didn't want the oil they had no place to put it i will pay you to take this contract i will pay you to take this contract right exactly right so they started saying how much how much do i have to pay you to take this off my hands and buyers all of a sudden found themselves in the position as long as they just twiddled their thumbs the price kept going down or the offer of of how much they would they would be paid to take this contract off of the off of the seller's hands uh, uh, kept going up, so they just twiddled their thumbs, and the market the market kept going down and down and down and down and down. That that was all confined. That's all confined to the WTR, WTI market. That was not going on on the West Coast. It wasn't going on in Brent. That was all confined to the WTR, WTI market. So that's what was really going on uh, yesterday. The one market, as I said, there's two platforms. One closed for May yesterday. The other's open today. The the, the today's its last day, um, and that platform now has WTI listed at a dollar twenty-two. So it's come back from negative. There are very few traders left in the market. The volume is very very low. Uh, but that price that you now find people these last drips and drabs of people. Who are trying to get rid of their, who want to get rid of their May oil, are back up in the positive. Their their sell, purchasers are offering at least a positive price, dollar twenty two at the moment, but a positive price to take these last drips and drabs off the market. May closes today on the second platform. Closes today, um, and it's gone. And we go, we roll over to future months, um, which are showing some effect. Uh, but they're not anywhere near negative. Uh, right. WTI, June WTI, which is the next contract up, is 15 right now. Uh, June on Brent is $20. So we're we're not we're not in negative territory on the contracts that are uh, on the June contracts that are showing up. But but what but what you can see in the market is a concern about when this low demand environment. Um, uh, shows up because if you look at June, let's let's take WTI. June right now is fifteen dollars. 
when you get to December, it's thirty dollars. So somewhere in there, people are saying, okay, the market's going to clear. The, the OPEC reductions are going to take effect. We're going to have a bunch of producers in the U.S. go bankrupt. That's going to take oil off the market. We're going to have uh, the Western Can or the yeah the Western Canada supply shut in. The oil sands shut in. That's going to take all oil off the market. Demand's going to start picking back up as we start having a reopening of, of business uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, and so the market's going to clear. We're going to come back into some sort of supply demand balance. The market's just unsure when, when that's going to happen, though. I mean, it, it was clear yesterday that it wasn't going to happen in May. Right. There, there was more oil for May than, than there was market and storage capacity, so that's why the panic set in. It's clear today, June is down a lot from where it was yesterday. Uh, it opened this morning um, at... Um, uh, Twenty dollars, uh, and it's now down to fifteen. So, so June, it, it, there's there's a little uncertainty about June, and we may say see the June price uh, start going down as well as people who hold June contracts uh, uh, want to get rid of them uh, and start panicking a little bit. But but at some point, the futures market is telling us the market's going to clear, uh, and we're going to come back up, come back up into the thirties. <laughs> As opposed to stay down, stay down at these lower levels. So essentially, the futures markets, you have a bunch of guys who decide we're going to buy the inventory for a store, just as an example. And we know that that inventory is going to be delivered and stores are going to want this material. And so we're going to bet that they want to buy it. Uh, and so we'll buy it first and we'll hold on to it. And when the time comes, they'll be ready to go. The people who buy it at the end are the people who are actually end users, right? Right. Right. Or and, yeah, right. Yeah, so or end users or stores, but I mean they're the right. ones that eventually want the physical product. Right. And so they're all betting on the if come on the futures market that I think I'm going to buy the product the the contract now to deliver low and then when it uh, when it comes time that people actually need the physical product, I'll be in the catbird seat because I have it in hand unless of course the pandemic hits in which case <laughs> I will be paying you to take this off my hand. So yeah. <laughs> well, that that's certainly the lesson out of yesterday. <laughs> yeah, holy cow! I was watching that. I was watching the ticker go, and I would just, I mean, just watched it plummet from twelve dollars, and when it got down into the fifteen cent range, I thought, well, this is weird, and then poof, it just stopped at zero. I was like, wow, it's it's amazing. Yeah, but we need to keep in mind, and 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 this is something we probably need to explore during the break or after the break. But we need to keep in mind that was going on in the WTI market. It was not going. It's not. It was not going on in the Brent market. The Brent market's going down a little bit, but it's not doing anything near near like what went on at the WTI market yesterday or what's going on in the WTI market today. And and the Alaskans need to be a lot more concerned about the Brent market because that's what affects the West Coast a lot more than than the <clears throat> WTI market. Well what does this what does this do for Alaska? I mean, so break this down. I mean, we all saw it, the headlines, everything, you know, panic, uh, houses on fire. What does this mean for Alaska here in, in two and a half minutes or so? Tell me, tell yeah. me, what does it mean? A excellent question. So what's going on in the West Coast market right now is, is something different uh, that's driving the Alaska price down, uh, the ANS price down. But don't people should not expect the ANS price to do what the WTI price uh, market did yesterday. What's going on in the West Coast market um, is, is the Saudis, when the Saudis said – they were going to go full bore. They were going to produce out full bore. Um, the way they did that was was to ha was to create a huge discount off their usual selling price, um, and to send out ships. If you can visualize this, send out ships, a, a bunch of ships, more ships to markets that they had historically served, but they sent out sh ships to markets that they historically had not been that big a player in. And what happened on the U what's happened on the U.S. West Coast in April is the Saudis came in with with some huge deliveries in April. There was a good Platts article on this yesterday. The Saudis came in with some huge deliveries in April at a very big discount, a discount that, frankly, uh, to some degree, relates to the uh, the Brent price or the WTI price. Usually doesn't show up that way on the U.S. West Coast, but because of the way Saudi was discounting and the way Saudi was basing the price on the U.S. West Coast, uh, it was sort of creeping some of this some of this WTI effect 
over into the U.S. West Coast market. So that has that 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 sort of increased surge of Saudi deliveries in April, um, and the discount at which Saudi was selling it uh, in April has been driving down uh, the U.S. West Coast market and ANS. Which which sells in exclusively into the U.S. West Coast market, ANS has been has been going down with it, but that's not it's not being driven by WTI. It's being driven by the Saudi volumes, um, and by the discount on the Saudi volumes. What's important to understand is that discount goes away May one. Saudi has re as part of the OPEC plus and the G20 deal done earlier this month. Saudi committed to reduce volumes. And and the way Saudi is doing that is undoing the discount that they had been using to try to penetrate markets they hadn't they hadn't been big in, and as a result of the production decrease, they're they're not trying to surge volumes into into all of these markets as much as they were. So once we get to May, the Saudi discount that's been driving down the ANS price or driving down the West Coast price and, and affecting ANS, that discount goes away. And the um, and the and the Saudi increased Saudi volumes that had that had been that's affecting the April price uh, starts starts backing off. So we ought to see the U.S. West Coast price once we get to May, uh, the U.S. West Coast price sort of rebalancing toward Brent, um, and and this 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 deep dive that's been taking as a result of. Of the Saudi flotilla coming into coming into the West Coast, if you can visualize that, um, as as a result of these Saudi deliveries coming into the West Coast, we, we ought we ought to see that discount, the effects of that discount going away. Crash course in economics, uh, well, the economics of the stock market, I guess, from Brad Keithley. Interesting stuff. Uh, good to know, um, you know, exactly how some of this stuff works. I had no idea that the uh, that the uh, OPEC nations had started to run a, fl a flotilla into the uh, West Coast to fire sale this stuff off, but it definitely makes sense now uh, as to exactly. I mean, you know, it's a free market. I mean, a refinery says I got one tanker that'll sell it to me at, you know, ten dollars a barrel, and another one that'll sell it to me at eight dollars a barrel. I'll take the eight dollar barrel oil. Thank you very much. And uh, it makes sense that that uh, is driving the price down. Uh, what's it mean, you know, for Alaskan budgets uh, for the foreseeable future? You think this is too short term to really affect us for too long, Brad? Well, no. Um, I think the the oil markets are in disarray. I mean, it's the W. It, it's really mostly confined to WTI, but but Brent is also trying to figure out the Brent price is also trying to figure out when demand's going to return. I mean, the Brent price right now. The June Brent price is twenty twenty one dollars. The December Brent price is thirty four dollars. Um, and so Brent's trying to figure out when this demand, uh, 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 pa the 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 pall on demand, uh, is going to lift um, as well. It's it's it affects WTI more because WTI is really a smaller market. It's all around the U.S. Gulf Coast and the U.S. Mid Continent, and to some degree the U.S. Atlantic Coast. Um, and 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 when you have a collapse in demand like we've had uh, for product from that market, for refinery product from that market, uh, there's really not a whole lot of other demand, or you, you can't really spread it out much. Um, Brent, on the other hand, is priced in a market that that's fairly broad, um, and and so it doesn't really get affected as much by the events of the moment. Uh, if you will, as the WTI market is, but Brent Brent is still being affected, and some people have said the the, the data is really opaque on this, but some people have said that we're we're going to still has so, sort of had a have a hangover effect on the U.S. West Coast because the Saudi deliveries that are being made in April at the steep discount, some of that's going into storage, right? Um, and so it's going to start coming out. It's going to sit there and it's going to be there in storage as we come into May. And it's going to have this overhang on the May price as well and possibly even into June because it was a heck of a lot of Saudi oil that came in at that at that price discount. Well, so, and demand is so low because of COVID right. and everything else. So, But, I mean, they're, they're doing the right thing and buying up everything they can and storing as much as they can at this cheap, cheap price so that later on they can turn a larger yeah. profit. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but it shouldn't it shouldn't overhang much because Saudi, as a result of the OPEC Plus and G G20 agreement, 
Saudi is is sort of reducing production, not trying to penetrate markets. As I said, the discount, they they flipped the discount back, and it's not it's gone back to historic levels. It's not at at the steep discount they were coming in with in April, and so the the, the West Coast market should be less affected and should should get out of this uh, fairly soon. But but we're but I mean we're going to be in a low price environment even when we get out of this. I mean, as I said, December is uh, the December price is thirty four dollars. It's not forty dollars. It's not fifty dollars. It sure as heck isn't sixty dollars or seventy dollars. It's thirty four dollars. Right. And the the June price next the June twenty one price next year's June price is thirty seven dollars right now. So we're not we're not even seeing getting back to forty dollars. The the market even the Brent market's not seeing getting back to forty dollars by uh by even even by June of next year. Um, and so we're we're going to be in this this lower price environment, but but the but the collapse of yesterday, the WTI collapse of yesterday, I think is a fairly isolated event. And even if it persists, even if we continue to see prices being driven down, they're going to be WTI prices. They're not going to be Brent prices, and as a consequence, they're not going to be that that reflected on the on the U.S. West Coast. Um, uh, uh, Robert says U.S. oil is exported. Don't know what happens to Alaska crude. Alaska crude gets exported to the West Coast, right? I mean, they're the sole, pretty much the sole source or the sole uh, recipient of uh, of North Slope crude. Yeah. Uh, so U.S. Uh, uh, when Alaska had two million barrels a day, we put some into the U.S. Gulf Coast. We threw it through the Panama Canal, put some in the U.S. Gulf Coast, and we put some overseas and in in internationally at a, at a layer point once we were released to do that. But right now. At, at the 500,000 barrels a day that we're running right now, all of that's being absorbed uh, into the U.S. West Coast. The U.S. West Coast is a fairly big market, uh, barely, fairly big refinery market because of California and, and Washington and sort of the penetration they make into Arizona and some of the Rocky Mountain states. Um, and it can easily absorb, easily absorb uh, the, the, all of the ANS. And so you have West Coast refineries are sort of all set up you set your refinery up based upon the crudes that you have available, and West Coast refineries are all sort of set up to to use A and S, um, and and so they just absorb the A and S, uh, okay. and it really doesn't go anyplace else. We just finished up with number one. We're moving on to number two. Number two is the election cycle. What are, you know? Will it be about fiscal year twenty two, and how is that shaping up? Not this year. But fiscal year 22 and what's it look like, uh, Brad? What are your thoughts? Well, as we get as we get toward uh, the election cycles, we get toward August, the primaries, and then the general election in November. What people are going to be focused on, which people should be focused on, is how we're going to deal with the fiscal situation uh, that's going to that's going to confront the legislature next January when they when when these people that we're electing um, take office. And the fiscal situation they're going to be confronting next January is a little bit of cleanup from from fiscal year 21, which begins July 1 of this year and runs to June 30 of next year. A little bit of cleanup from that because, you know, to the extent that oil prices are, the extent that oil prices don't hit the the revenue projection on which the FY 21 budget is based, uh, we're going to have to do a supplemental, and that may that may be a a very uh, uh, difficult supplemental, but it's going to be sort of cleanup from FY21. The real focus of the legislature when they meet next year, again, what these people are running for is going to be FY22 uh, and setting the budget ahead for FY22. And FY22, I mean, we, <laughs> you think we have it difficult now. Um, FY22 is going to be a, an extremely extremely difficult fiscal year, FY22 and beyond. Um, the reason is that we've, we've been sort of living in an artificial world the last eight years, and, and even into FY21, uh, financed in significant part by draws on our fiscal reserves, draws on the statutory budget reserve at first, draws on the constitutional budget reserve, the CBR, uh, 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 later, uh, and we've sort of we've sort of artificially uh, been able to maintain these spending levels without having to confront uh, uh, huge problems. I mean, we we've had PFD cuts; those are big problems. But but w without having to confront huge problems, 
uh, because we've had the, C the SBR and then the CBR to back us up. Uh, the numbers, the, one of the numbers that we saw come out when the FY21 budget came out was just stunning. Keep in mind, keep in mind that at one point we had $17 billion in reserves between the SBR at about $5 billion and the CBR at about $12 billion. We had $17 billion in reserves. And we've been working that, working our way through those since about 20, FY 2013. Um, w the numbers that the administration showed uh, at, uh, when, when the governor signed the budget was the CBR amount at the end of fiscal year 21. So uh, uh, the, at the end of this coming fiscal year, the end of the fiscal year they just set the budget for, the CBR amount was $60 million. <laughs> From 17 billion with a B uh, at the beginning of that, we're down to 60 million with an M uh, dollars. Now there's some dispute, about a 300 million dollar dispute between the legislature, legislative finance, and and the administration on what the right amount is. Legislative finance says it'll be about 400 million dollars. But I'll tell you this: if whatever the number is, if 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 we have if this oil price problem continues into FY21, continues deep into FY21, or the FY21 revenue uh, projection is $37 a barrel. If we, if we continue to have prices in the 20s, uh, 25, low 30s, uh, deep into 2021, we're not going to hit $37 a barrel. And if we don't hit $37 a barrel in FY21, we're going to drain the CBR completely, dry, regardless of what the CBR amount is. Right, 400 or 60, 400 million or 60, 60 million, it don't, yeah. don't matter a lick at this point. Right, so we're going to completely drain it. So we're going to hit FY22. When this legislature goes into the legislature, when whoever's elected this fall goes into the legislature in January, they're going to go in without the CBR cushion. Um, uh, a very minimal one, if we if we luck out and oil prices do okay uh, in FY21, uh, zero if oil prices don't luck out. And some people say, well, then we'll just start taking from the ERA. We'll just, we'll we'll you know eliminate the PFD. And we'll start taking from the ERA. Well, folks, that doesn't get you very far. <laughs> the the ERA um, is like six five five six seven billion dollars by the time all of the all the stuff gets finished this year. Um, and you need, I mean, that we're down to our last, we're down to, we're down to pulling stuff out of couch cushions now. Right. And, and even if you say you can use the ERA, I, I, I don't think we should, it's a tax on future generations, but even if you say we can use the ERA, um, that's not going to last us very long. So the legislature that comes in, uh, that's elected this year and is in, takes office, in January and starts to confront the FY21 budget is going to, is going to, they're, they're the end of the road. They're the ones that are finally going to have to hit reality. And here's reality based upon the oil price projections that the, that the uh, department of revenue put out in the spring revenue forecast plus, and even counting uh, POMV 50, 50, that is before you get into PFD cuts, uh, we have about $2 billion in revenue. Spending levels that the governor just approved uh, for this past year are four, was four point six billion dollars. So you're going to have it, it, so revenues are going to be about two point two billion. So you're going to have right off the bat about a two point four billion dollar deficit facing you in FY twenty one without uh, the safety net of the CBR uh, sitting underneath you, uh, and you're going to have to confront that. Immediately, so that means if if you're if you're one of those people who believe in well we'll just cut spending, you know that that's how we're going to solve all this. That means you're going to cut the budget in one year. You're going to cut the budget have to cut the budget more than fifty percent, more than two billion dollars, uh, in order to get down to what the revenue level uh, is going to be uh, with the with the the draw from the legislature or the draw from the permanent fund at POMV fifty fifty. Um, if you're one of these people who believe that well, we'll just eliminate the PFD. Well, that gets you about another billion five um, uh, if, you, if you completely eliminate the B PFD, but you're still uh, between a half billion and a full billion short uh, of paying for just holding uh, the budget e even last year. Um, so the, the, the people who come in in FY, the people who are elected this year, 
to me, they need to be held accountable. What exactly are you going to do? You know, none of this mealy mouth stuff about, well, I'm for PFD, but, you know, we have to be realistic and I, I oppose taxes and, and we're just going to cut our way. Uh, we're going to cut our way to, to, you know, to, to the budget. They need to be held to to a fairly high level of specificity about what it is exactly uh, uh, they support, because because the time for mealy mouth, the time for for you know uh, uh, high grandiose terms uh, about you know how you're going to do this, knowing you've got the CBR underneath you, uh, the time to the time for that sort of language is gone. Uh, when we hit FY21, FY22. Um, you, you're going to have to have, you know, solved the mystery of how you pay for Alaska government at its current levels uh, with revenues that are about half those levels. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a huge issue. That's sort of even before that. That assumes the oil market gets straightened out by them. That assumes we're over this temporary aberra- this temporary situation of demand having collapsed because of COVID. Uh, and, and assumes some normal restoration uh, of demand, and thus the oil prices sort of return to the to the forecast levels. Uh, uh, 37 in uh, FY21, and I think it's 38 or 39 uh, in FY22 that we've somehow gotten back uh, to those levels. But but it's a huge issue uh, that the people who are elected this fall are going to have to confront, and. And the time for vacillation and the time for, I really favor this, but I couldn't get everybody else to agree to it. And so we're just going to have to draw the CBR again, bad, bad. That's gone. (laughs) Oh, man. And just to make it clear for Lee out there, who I'm sure wants everybody to hear, when you said we had $17 billion, that's $17,000 million, and we got down to forty. million. So we had seventeen thousand. Now we're at forty. And, sixty, sixty, or I mean, sixty. Let's, let's I'm not, sorry, sixty. Let's... I, I apologize. <laughs> sixty. I'm sorry. Four hundred or sixty. There's one of the two. It's either sixty or four hundred. We had seventeen thousand in the bank. Now we've got sixty or four hundred. We can't tell which because you know math is hard. And uh, and and yeah. So it, I guess we're fighting over sticks at the bottom line there. No, no. It's four hundred. We had seventeen thousand. What do we do now? I mean, it's. <laughs> It's a train wreck. It's an absolute train wreck. Yeah, and and you know people say, well, we'll just draw on the ERA. I mean, that's I, I've heard people. I, I just I get so agitated. I've heard people say, well, the the ERA is really our 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 uh, uh, rainy day fund. You know, so we'll just draw on the rainy day fund. No, folks, the CBR was the rainy day fund. The twelve billion dollars we had in the CBR was the rainy day fund. That and we and we've just run through it. We don't get to say. Well, now we've used up that rainy day fund. We got another rainy day fund out out here. Right. The ERA is there. It's part of the permanent fund invest, investment base. It's what us and future generations are counting on to have invested in the market to generate additional earnings to sort of see us through the the decades ahead. Uh, you start eating that. I mean, we use the phrase eating the seed corn. I mean, you start you start consuming that, and we're just we're just going downhill. I mean, we're we're going back to 1960s Alaska uh, at that point. So we 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 had the rainy day fund. We had a huge rainy day fund. We had a rainy day fund that was the envy of the world, and we drained it. Yep, and it looks like we'll probably you give them their fingers, give them their druthers, and they'll drain the other one too. And then, of course, they want to look at how do we get into the permanent fund. That's the next. That's the next choice because they have no fiscal discipline. I mean, that's the bottom line here. There's no fiscal discipline whatsoever to make it happen. Which again has that's, been. I'm sorry. Well, that's why we need to hold them account. I, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but that's why we need to hold candidates accountable this coming election cycle because they're the ones. Finally, we're at the end. They're the ones that are going to have to deal with the eclipse or the the apocalypse, right? With the, with with falling off the the fiscal cliff, and 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 they need they need to be honest with their constituents about how they're going to do that, as opposed to just uh, you know some of these high platitudes that we've had in past election cycles. We got about uh, two and a half, three minutes here. I don't know if you could squeeze your Social Security talk into that length of time, but I wanted to give you one bite of the apple here for number three, if you wanted to crack on it real quick. I appreciate that. So. What's going on on the federal side is is sort of as as bad in some ways as uh, what's going on with the oil market. 
in the span of, of just a few months, we're going to increase the size of the federal deficit by roughly 25%. We're going to go from a, def a national debt, uh, increase the size of the debt, excuse me, not the deficit, increase the size of the debt by about 25%. We're going to go from a national debt that's about 80% of GDP to a national debt that's going to be over 100% of GDP by the time we, we get through even the current rounds of COVID spending. Uh, and if we add additional COVID spending, uh, that's going to increase it even more. That's going to create pressure on future budgets. Uh, and one of the one of the things staring us in the face out there, I'm trying to find a way to personalize this to people, but one of the things that's staring us in the face out there is the Social Security Trust Fund is rapidly running out. In fact, it's running out even faster uh, as a result of COVID-19 because the way the Social Security way the Social Security works is payroll taxes. Uh, largely fund current Social Security payments, and the trust fund sort of comes in and tops it off. Well, payroll taxes are way down as a result of unemployment. Payroll taxes are way down, uh, and as a result of payroll taxes being way down, the, the funds coming into the Social, Social Security account are way down, and as a result, we're co consuming the trust fund, sort of the, the savings account for Social Security. We're consuming it at a much faster rate. So we've previously talked about Social Security running out in the mid-2030s. Now, because of this effect, the, the end date for the trust fund is being, is being brought forward, uh, brought closer in time uh, significantly. When we, hit, when we hit whenever date we finally wake up to that, oh, and what happens when the trust fund runs out? Social Security payments are cut down to the level of whatever payroll taxes will support at the time. And the estimates are that's about a 25% or 30% cut uh, in Social Security payments uh, at that time. So we're facing that sort of fiscal cliff with respect to Social Security in the early 2030s. What's, what's ha with, with, with national debt increasing, interest payments are going to increase. And as a consequence, um, the, the, the strain on the federal budget to pay interest um, is increasing. God, if interest rates go up, we're really going to be screwed. But but even even if interest rates stay low, debt payments stay, debt interest rates stay low. We're, the the component of the budget going to interest is going to increase as we're increasing the national debt. That's all going to come to a head with Social Security, um, and and we're going to get there with a much higher debt level than we thought we were going to get. We're going to get there with a much much earlier than we thought we were going to get because the trust funds being drained and in in. in as a result of lower payroll taxes, um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to come to a head. The effect of all that is going to be put a significant strain on, so, on, on Social Security reform, but, but beyond Social Security on the entire budget, on national defense and on, on everything else. It's critically, I understand why the federal government's doing what it's doing right now, but it's critically important that we, know, that we not just say, oh, the federal government can print money. We need it for everything. We need it for, oh, let's pick it. Let's pick a, an example. We need it for Alaska Native corporations as well as tribal corporations. We need it for every airport in the world, uh, uh, it, even though some airports don't need it. We need to be very careful about what we're spending money on through, the, through COVID uh, because it's going to come back to haunt in terms of increasing the debt. It's going to come back to haunt us very quickly in a, and in yep. a very real manner as we confront things like social security and other things oh it's just gonna get you're just a pot of fun and joy this morning brad thank you so much for coming in and joining us today we really appreciate it well that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from alaskans for sustainable budgets thank you again for joining us remember that you can find past episodes on our youtube soundcloud and spotify pages and keep track of us during the week on facebook and twitter it's been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.